Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Everybody take a Bible, and I know this is the cream of the crop. Young people, look right here. Listen to me. I want you to take a Bible. If you don't have a Bible, share a Bible with somebody or look it up in your, in your phone or whatever it takes. But I want everybody in the building to look at 1 Thessalonians. You say, where is that? It's right before 2 Thessalonians. Does that help you? Amen. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5 and look at verse number 22 and 23. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23. Abstain from every form of evil. Every way in which evil would make itself known in the culture, and by the way, it's staggering to read the statistics of what's going on in the church. Now everybody lean in and look at me. Listen, look at me, listen. We've got a problem in America. The problem is not so much in the White House, although that isn't helping anything. The answer is not political. It's amazing to me how many Christians can get all frothed at the mouth over political issues when that's not really the issue. The issue's in the church. When I got saved, I'll never forget Billy Graham. I got to work with Billy Graham in the 80s. Billy Graham said one out of three Americans, according to the Gallup poll, claims to be born again. I thought, man, that's incredible. We knew there weren't really one out of three Americans that were born again. The nation would have been different if that would have been the case. But that was the statistic. Well, the statistics have just come out this year from Ed Stetzer and Lifeway Research. Eight percent of the people in America now claim to be born again in one generation. The statistics have gone from one out of three, 33% of Americans claiming to be born again, down to 8%. At the same time, in one generation, the people who say, I have no religious preference whatsoever, they were 4% in 1980 when I got saved. Now, they're 24%. 20, look at me, 24% of the people in America, when asked what religion are you, they say nothing. I'm nothing. And I want to tell you, the problem's not out there. The problem's right in here. And the problem is, many times, you cannot differentiate between the way people inside the church live and the way people outside of the church live. And so the, ch- the world looks at the church and says, man, I don't see any difference. You claim to be a Christian, but you commit adultery. You claim to be a Christian, but you've got pornography issues. You claim to be a Christian, but you beat your wife. You claim to be a Christian, but you struggle with alcohol addiction and all the other, every form of evil, listen to me, is in the church. Paul says, I want you to abstain from that, and then he tells us how. Look at verse number 23. Now, and this is kind of a prayer that he prays, now may the God of peace himself say the next word, Sanctify. Say it out loud. Sanctify. What does that mean? It means to set you apart as different from the world. Amen. May God himself cause you to be different than the rest of the world. And he says, I want God to sanctify you completely. May your whole spirit, now look at this, and your soul and your body be preserved blameless at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. By the way, I believe that Jesus is right on the verge of coming again. I believe that with all my heart. Now, things might get real bad. Matter of fact, let me just tell you, things are going to get real bad before he comes. But he's coming. And when he comes, he's looking for a church that is different than the world, and then he says this, to encourage us, and this is so good. Look at verse number 24. He says, he who calls you to be sanctified, set apart, abstain from every, every kind of evil, every form of evil, he is faithful who also will, what? Do it. Now, everybody look right up here before Gina comes. God created us in his, say it, image. That means that we mirror in many ways who God is. God is communicative. If you read the first chapter of Genesis, God said, God said, God said, 
God said. God has given us the ability, it's powerful, to communicate. God is communal. God is complex. There is one God, but we sang about it a moment ago, the Godhead, three in one, Father, Spirit, say it, Son, that's what we believe. We believe that there is one God who eternally exists in three separate but equal persons, trace personas, una substantia, three persons, one substance, one God, whom we call Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now listen to me. God made us to image who he is. So God made us triune beings. And that means that we have a body, and that means we have a soul. Your body in Greek is soma, your soul is suke, and then your spirit is pneuma. And when you got saved, like this guy here, isn't that wonderful? Guy got saved on Sunday morning. He's an usher on Sunday night. Isn't that wonderful? When you got saved, your spirit that died in Adam Amen? By one man's sin, death and sin passed upon all men, for all have sinned. So we're sinners by birth, by nature, and we're sinners by choice. Our sin nature guarantees that we're going to act out because our spirit is dead, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, and you has he quickened who were, say it, dead in trespasses. And So you were born with a dead spirit. Your back was born toward God from the moment of your conception. I mean, even a little baby has a sin nature. And if you don't believe that, work in the nursery next Sunday. Amen? Now, when you got born again, when you repented, the Holy Spirit helped you to do an about face, a U-turn, and you said, Jesus, come into my heart. That's exactly what happened. Jesus, in the person of the Holy Spirit, because the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, though distinct, yet cooperate and operate together. And so Jesus, in the person of the Holy Spirit, like air coming into your lungs, came into your dead spirit, and you came alive. Amen? You were spiritually alive for the first time in your life. Now, that began the process of you being saved. So I was saved in February of 1980 in a jail cell in Fort Worth. But listen, but I am still being saved today. So are you saved? Well, yes, but not yet. You're being saved. Now, where are you being saved? Now, listen very carefully, and then Jesus is going to come. God is in the process of saving your soul. Your spirit is sealed with the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. Your body will be completely transformed at the coming of Jesus when those who are dead in Christ will be raised and then those who remain will be caught up and instantaneously, even our body and then all of creation will be transformed. Amen? You talk about a solution to the ecology crisis. God's got it. It's called the second coming of Jesus, when your body is transformed. But in between, listen, in between the moment you were what the Bible calls justified, just as if I'd never sinned, and the moment in which you are glorified, in between the justification and the glorification, there is a process called, say it, sanctification. And it is the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit who lives within you and who comes upon you at the baptism of the Holy Spirit to work in you and set you apart in every area of the realm of your suke. We talk about psychologists or your mind and your will and your emotions, and that is where the real battle takes place. The battle doesn't take place in your spirit. Your spirit's sealed. The battle really doesn't take place in your body only as an effect of what's going on in your soul, your mind. The battle is in your mind. The battle is in your will. The battle is in your emotions, the way you feel, the way you respond, the way you react, the choices that you make, and the way that you think. You're stinking thinking that drives you to do things that no Christian should ever do. And it's very possible for you to give ground 
Sometimes a trauma in your life causes ground to be taken. Sometimes an episode in your life, somebody hurts you very deeply, bruises you. For me, it was my mom. Growing up in a home where I saw my mom with one man after another, formed a protective layer of bitterness and hardness and unforgiveness that did not go away. Even after I got saved, it didn't go away. And it became an, a, a place where the devil had a stronghold. Now, Christians cannot be demon-possessed. Your spirit is possessed by Jesus. But the devil can get strongholds. You can call it oppression. You can call it whatever you want to. But they are strongholds. I'm going to show you one more verse, and Gene is going to come. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter number 10. All right, let me show you this just to set up what she has to say. Look, look back, take a left, and go back to 2 Corinthians. You say, where's that? Right after 1 Corinthians. Amen. It's to the left. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter number 10, and I want to show you where the real battle is. And then Gene is going to share her testimony. Why is it that Christians... I mean, people who are born again. Why is it that we struggle with our thoughts, emotions that are out of control, anger? Why is it that we make the choices that we don't even want to make? Well, look what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, because I want you to be free. I'm convinced that the reason the world is in the mess that it's in is that Christians are not walking in freedom walking in love, walking in joy, walking in power to be transformative agents in this city. So look at 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and look at verse number 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. So Paul says we're here, we're in a body, but our real warfare and battle really is not with flesh and blood, he says in Ephesians as well. And then he talks about what our warfare is. Verse number four, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not fleshly. It's not something you can shoot or strangle or drown. It's not a person in the sense of a physical person, but it's more real than that. Look what he says. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for the pulling down of, say the next word, strongholds. What are strongholds? Well, here's what they are. Verse number five, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, anything that keeps us from really knowing God and walking in the power of God becomes a stronghold. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds, casting down arguments. Those are vain thoughts and imaginations. Every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every, say the next word, thought, every thought, the way we think, into captivity to the obedience of Christ and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. So, Gina... Honey, come on up here. Had a dramatic deliverance from, and you never would have dreamed. Because tell them, honey, just tell them about your story. Hi, how is everyone? Well, I grew up in a pastor's home, and um, um, my parents loved the Lord. We just had a loving family, and I was saved when I was about eight years old. And gave my life to Christ and began growing in my faith and walking according to the Word of God just as a young child. And um, kind of prided myself on being such a good Christian, you know, throughout high school. And didn't go to the parties and didn't drink and do all the things that I tended to look down on those that did. So I started developing kind of a pharisaical way of thinking about people and even... Christian, you know, being a Christian, being proud to be a Christian. And um, as I got older, I went into college and um, went into education. And But always in the back of my mind, I was always very anxious and very irritable and very worried and just had this negative um, kind of an anger spirit that kind of lurked behind all the facade and all the, all the Christian 
uh, ways of being. You know, on the outside, we can look so great, and everybody really looked up to me in my youth group and on into college, and I did love the Lord, and I did have, tried to have that discipline of, of reading my Bible and praying, and, but as I got older, I just, this anger started to just keep swirling around. Well, my family, um, my dad was always very loving and a very wonderful man, but his father was a real, ang- had a lot of anger issues, and was very verbally abusive to my fam- to my father and to his brothers, and so my father would always say, well, us, us um, Irish, we're just Irishmen, and we just have this anger that we have to deal with, and we're just Irish. Well, my dad would fight against that, and I never saw my dad angry. I never did. He, he loved God, and he served the Lord faithfully. But as I got older, I just struggled with anger, and I struggled with just have explosive bits of anger. And when things just didn't go my way, I would just just burst out with anger. Well, as Scott and I got married and we began traveling and preaching the gospel and seeing many great things happen and great salvations and many people um, come to Christ, we began to start a church. And um, being a pastor's wife is not the easiest thing in the world, I'm just going to tell you. So people, I would get really angry and I would get real irritable with people. And um, I would go to the altar, and I would just cry and pray and say, God, just forgive me and help me to have more peace in my heart and and to have a sweeter spirit. And I would just pray and ask for forgiveness over and over many times at the altar and confide in friends that I, I just, I've got this thing going up here where I'm supposed to be so perfect and have it all together, but inside I've just got this, just this swirling, um, I just couldn't really describe it. I just had a lot of unrest inside of my, inside of my heart. And um, my husband, I'm so proud and thankful that I had a really man of God, a real spiritual man of God that would really encourage me. And it was a journey, I think, for my life because I was saved. There was no doubt in my heart that I knew Christ was Lord of my life, and I was saved. But I had a lot of bondage inside that just needed to let go. I just needed to let go of it. And I think as you grow up, giving your life to Christ at a young age, you tend to suppress all those things and think you've got it all together. And everybody thinks you've got it all together. They look up to you and think you're great. But behind closed doors, and you know yourself, and you know there are things in your heart that just, they're just not right. You know, there's just, you stay awake at night, and I just have so much anxiety and unrest in my heart. And um, so he gave me a book to read, and it was a sweet man of God that was a preacher that preached to thousands of people. And he would get up and preach, and thousands of people would be saved year after year. But inside, he had bondages in his life. And I started reading that book, and I thought, man, I need to be set free. I just need to be set free from the bondages that are holding me down and not to excuse them and not to think, well, that's just the way, you know, we're just Irish and we just have those things that we have to deal with and try to excuse um, the sin and, and the bondage that you have in your heart, but to really come clean. And I think for the first time in my life, I was able to really get real with, with God and with my husband and with myself and say, I've got some things that I really want the Lord to just release me from and set me free so that I can be free indeed. Because, you know, Jesus, when he went away, he told his disciples, I'm going away, but I'm going to send a helper. I'm gonna, he's going to come back, and I'm, I'm, I've got to go away, but I'm going to send a helper, and it was the Holy Spirit, to not only be with you like I'm with you, but he's going to be in you. And so when you have the Holy Spirit in you, He has the power to change you. You know, Jesus has gone away, but the Holy Spirit is here. He's here to make a difference and to um, do a mighty work of renewal and, and change in your life. And so I was able to just take the facade off and just really repent, but not only repent, because I had repented before. You know, I'd blow up at my husband, or I would be so anxious and have anxiety, and I would pray, Father, forgive me. I, want, I would get in the Word, and I would read, and I would memorize Scripture, and I would just, you know, will myself to do the right thing. And, and to, boy, if I could just make it one th- through one week of not having a fit, then that'd be great. And I would just literally just trying to check myself. Okay, today I did okay. All right, all right. Tomorrow, am, am, am I going to make it through every day? And I would just... And it was just it was just a bondage that I felt myself in, and um, 
And I know that it didn't, I wasn't out having adultery or all kinds of things like that. But inside I was, it was a big thing for me. It was a big deal that I really wanted to be free. So I asked the Holy Spirit and I remember just falling down and in our apartment, it wasn't even at church. We were just at home and I just fell down before the Lord and just cried out to him, Holy Spirit, I know you live in me, but I need you to do more in my life. I need you to come and set me free and fill me with your Holy Spirit so that I'm not in control of my life day by day, but you're in control. And I asked him to just fill me and baptize me and set me free. And um, I think for the first time in my life, I had come to the point where I needed the Holy Spirit and I couldn't do it on my own. I think it was that one that was, it was that mighty encounter with the Holy Spirit of God who came in there and saw my brokenness and saw my need for him and that, that I wasn't just this perfect little Christian, but I had so many things inside that needed to be released and just thrown aside. And I think we have to get rid of our pride. I think our pride, and I was very prideful. I think to no one what else would think I was prideful. But as I started growing in my Christian life and being released by the Holy Spirit, I realized so much religious pride was inside me. So much religious pride. I couldn't even lift my hands to the Lord in in praise because I was so prideful because I'd never done that before. And that's just not who I am. I'm very reserved. I don't I don't do that. And I remember my husband saying to me, well, honey, I don't think worshiping God is about you or what you're comfortable with. It's about giving praise and honor to God. So many things I grew. I just had to break down the walls of religious um, tradition and this spirit that I had it all together and just lay, lay myself bare before the Lord and get rid of all the pride. And it was a process. It was, and it's still a process. It's all, your Christian life is always a process. I think I had that one mighty encounter with the Holy Spirit that he had to set me free. But then it's just walking that out before the Holy Spirit every single day of your life. Because we're so quick to jump back on the throne of our life and say, I got it now. I, I, I've got it under control. But you know what? You don't. You absolutely do not have anything under control because the, the devil's always lurking about like a roaring lion, sinking whom he may devour. But the Holy Spirit is there to rescue you. He's there to just rescue you from danger. But you have to be willing to just lay aside all pride. Even if you've been saved for 20 or 30 or 40 years, you have to just say, it's not about me. It's not about what I've done for you, God, and all the mission trips I've been on for you, God. You know, all the, thing, all the people I've witnessed for you, it's him doing something in and through you, in and through your life, so that when those times come and when those pressures come or when you have a chance to worry, you can just be at peace and say, God, you're in control, and it's your will, not our will be done. And whatever comes our way, we're just going to trust you, and we're just going to trust your will to be done in and through our life and that all the things that happen in and through our life are going to work for good. One day, maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but if we will have faith and that God will increase your faith and that you will rise up in faith to believe him. But it's a day-by-day filling of the Holy Spirit. I think it's that one encounter where you realize, yes, God, I need your Holy Spirit to change me and make me like Jesus. And I know many of you have probably heard this all your life because you, you have a pastor that teaches you about the Holy Spirit. You know, I don't think we should be afraid of the Holy Spirit. I think so many times um, in traditions, you can be afraid of the Holy Spirit, and then you just think, well, you just kind of veer off to the side and just, I'm just going to read the Bible, and I'm going to memorize my scripture, and I'm good to go. All that is part of it, but you have to be able to speak to the Holy Spirit and allow him free reign in your life, whatever that looks like. Whatever the experience for you looks like, I think it's different for everybody. But I just praise God for that. I'm on a journey, and we're, I'm so thankful that we're teaching our children about the journey of the Holy Spirit, and they've had some mighty encounters with the Holy Spirit way, way ahead of where I was at their age. And so I praise God for that. But I just pray that you would just take the opportunity to just empty yourself of any pride anything that's holding you back, holding you back to love people freely, holding you back to 
to just give your life away the way the Lord really, really wants you to. And just ask the Holy Spirit to fill you and to break off those chains and to break off any bondages that we just, so many times we just think that they're just there and they're always going to be there. And there's nothing we can do about it. But there's, there's something you can do and it's the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, let me read what Paul said, and then I want to pray for you. Gina and I want to pray for you. It's not just normal for you to be so angry. That's not what Jesus wants. It's not normal for your lust to just be out of control. That's not what Jesus wants. That's not the spirit. Amen? It's not normal for you to be so bitter the normal Christian life is the Jesus life. Most of us are so subnormal that if we ever got normal, everybody think we were abnormal. But the normal Christian life is Jesus in us. Not just when we're at church, but in our homes, with our kids, in our business. That the people who know you the best say, man, that guy's like Jesus. That lady's like Jesus. Now, this is what Paul said, and then we're going to pray. He says, I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. Saying amen right there. For to will is present with me. I want to do what Jesus wants me to do, but how to perform what is good, I, I, can't, I, I just can't do it. By the way, that's the first step. Lord, I can't, but you can. I can't do it, Lord. For the good I, that I want to do, I don't do it. But the evil that I don't want to do, I, I practice that, Paul says. Now, this is Paul as a Christian. Now, if I do what I will not to do, it's no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. And so I find a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Well, thank God he doesn't stop there. He says, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord and then he goes on to say there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Now here's the key. To those who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Amen. Do you see that? So let me tell you what a lot of Pentecostals think. They think that if they went to youth camp and had an experience and spoke in tongues, that that's it. Or if they came to the altar one time and spoke in tongues, that's it. Now, I speak, spoke, speak in tongues and pray. I can't even speak with this tongue. I speak in tongues and pray every day. And it's cost me, by the way, because I, I wasn't a Pentecostal. But there's more to it. As I said this morning, some of the meanest people I've ever met in my life speak in tongues. Or have at one time. So it's not just the Holy Spirit's baptism to come upon you to enable you to speak. And that's wonderful, but that's not the end. That's just the beginning of learning how to follow Jesus. So what I want to ask you is this. Is there in you a hunger to be free? Is there in you a hunger to want to be so full of Jesus and so into the control of the Holy Spirit that he just comes out of you. You can't help it. It's just Jesus coming out. And everywhere you go, you're just smiling and telling people about Jesus. And it's real. It's not something you learn to do and you're forced to do it and you feel guilty if you don't. But you're just so full of Jesus. I told you before that if a mosquito bit you, he'd fly away singing, there's power in the blood, amen? I mean, just full of Jesus and kindness, no racism, no prejudice, no thinking you're better than other people, amen? Just full of Jesus. 
No anger, no bitterness, no bondage, no unforgiveness. Is there, and then you're just so full of his life that you become like a magnet. And people just say, man, what is it about you? I know you go to church, but I've met some of them other people that go to your church. You're different. What is it? And you say, it's Jesus. He's filling me. Is there anybody in this room who is hungry to be free and to be filled with the Spirit of God? If that's you, get up out of your seat and come down to this hall.